Hello, everybody. Today is April 12th, and today we're doing uh, government and security news. Wendell just made a comment that March is half gone, but March is already gone, and now April is half gone. <laughs> oh, no. It's just like our sanity. It's all it's just gone. It's gone. Also, you may notice Ryan is gone. He hurt himself exercising. <laughs> <laughs> Old age is getting to him. He's fine. He's just having trouble with Moving. stairs yeah. at this point. Yeah, he was like, he woke up this morning. He was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it in. <laughs> you know who else is having trouble with uh, a situation they put themselves Moving. in? Moving. Yeah. <laughs> the U.S. government. The U.S. government has just 1% of the EV chargers it needs. I, I looked into this. This is a little bit fear mongering because. They've also only replaced about 1% of their 672,000 vehicles nationwide with electric charger vehicles. And so this article is saying, well, if you're going to replace the whole fleet buying, you know, 60, 70,000 cars a year, uh, you're going to need some electric chargers. And we, there's not any. Oh, there's not enough. I, I think our town might be part of the 1% here. Yeah, we do. We actually have electric We have a couple, yeah. In the middle of nowhere. For the five people that have electric vehicles. Yeah, well, they're near, yeah, like the courthouse and stuff. So I assume the city put those in, but. Well, uh, there's a couple in uh, dealerships. So you can, oh, the dealership yeah, has like sense. a parking lot where you can go. And, and charge up. Yeah, and hang Do out. Do they charge for that? I bet they no, do. No, it's free. Oh, really? Yeah, it's free. It's totally free. Because again, the, for the five people, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, speaking of electric vehicles, we actually have a lot of electric vehicle news. Quite a few. This week. Uh, things are, it's, it's really... Electric vehicles are weird because, you know, producing them is, is hard. And uh, we're starting to finally get some recognition at the upper echelons of government that maybe that, yeah, it's hard to produce. Biden to invoke Defense Production Act for electric vehicle battery materials. Talking about nickel. Yeah. We're having trouble getting nickel for some reason. Mm. We don't want to buy it from people that are producing nickel. I mean, it makes sense why we're doing that. It's just very sudden. I, um, so I saw this story early in the week and... I kind of had this thought of like, well, that's probably good because it's more domestic production for here, but also like, what authority does that give them when they invoke that? Like, what other things are they going to try to sneak in with it? <laughs> We're going to go uh, really, really, really exploit the mineral resources of the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's like, oh. Mm. That's maybe okay. I mean, if a bunch of people end up not dying because of that, that's probably okay. Until they poison the waterways. It's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Oh, that report came out this week, too. It was like 60% of U.S. waterways not safe for swimming. Yeah. Mm. Which doesn't surprise me, but it's sad. It's all the rough. same. Yeah, it's not, it's not great. And then this happened. Volvo says its all-new vehicles now support over-the-air updates. If you get into a, a global spat with somebody, they could also be over the air bricking or your car stops working if you're, if the, if the country I, angers you. I also had the thought of like, does this mean cars are never finished? Kind of like with <laughs> games where like the game Software. is never just completed and put out. They well, have to keep pushing patch updates, which isn't necessarily bad if it's content, but a lot of times it's like they just ship an unfinished product and then they're like oh we'll fix it in post it's windows 11 it's ready it's in a, it's, it's cyberpunk <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it wasn't ready yeah so they're probably gonna start doing that with cars which is a little scarier i'm not I sure think. that cars really need to be this complicated i also had that thought do i really need this much gadgetry in my car you know what we really need we need meat grinders with over the air updates and firmware <laughs> And then when it messes up, you know, you just... Have you tried rebooting your meat grinder? Oh. <laughs> uh, in other, other government news... The SEC is reportedly investigating Amazon over its use of third-party seller data. So, this is fun. Last month, Congress also asked the DOJ to investigate the Amazon relation to the practice. So basically, if you're a third-party seller on Amazon, is Amazon using your data for anti-competitive reasons? Are they using the data for price fixing? Are they using the data? There's a lot of really creative things you can do with that data. <laughs> the answer is yes. And we've covered that <laughs> in the past, that Amazon absolutely will steal your idea and sell it for less. Now, what's interesting here, though, is that uh, the SEC is doing the investigation. The SEC is the Standards and Exchange Commission. They have to do with trading stocks. This is not the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, or any of those. Um, I think the folks over at Reddit in uh, Wall Street Bets have shown that the SEC might be one of the most corrupt institutions. <laughs> Perhaps the most toothless institution to go <laughs> after Amazon, maybe? Yeah, I mean, th they've demonstrated blatant corruption at, at, at very high levels, and it just doesn't really give me a lot of confidence in the SEC, unless the SEC is going to produce subterfuge to pop up and say, no, this is completely it's fine. It's fine. Well, it's... Uh 
we did the story about the guy who was selling camera bags, right? And then what? A few months later, Amazon started selling the exact same bag. Yeah. I mean, that's not coincidence. I mean, you know, if you're just idiot level rando looking at this, it's like, wow, it seems like Amazon is behaving anti-competitively. Mm. That seems weird, but I'm sure the SEC is going to come up with something really elaborate to tell us why that's not really the case and why what they're doing is good for business. Deny the evidence of your eyes and ears, citizen. (laughs) I don't know. Uh, You know, engagement challenge, why is the SEC doing this? Like, this doesn't seem to be their purview, and it seems like if they were investigating this, it would, I, I can't imagine that they would come to the same conclusion that you know the general public would literally anybody else would yeah as evidenced by their conclusions and other things to do with stock trading hmm anyway the fbi is spending millions on social media tracking software they want to be able to see everything is that surprising no i yeah i mean <laughs> how did we not already know this <laughs> the sub headline is yeah it's raising surveillance concerns yeah you think we're already there <laughs> you remember what the postal service was doing and then they said oh the postal service shouldn't be spying on on this kind of thing and saving everybody's social media well the fbi is doing it now it's like oh 5,000 licenses to use babel x i think we'll hear a lot about babel x soon <sighs> that's probably like going to be the new hot one like Pal- palantir yeah Probably they're going to do this and then hope that it leads to some kind of arrest or some kind of like an event prevention situation. And then they're going to say, well, we wouldn't have been able to prevent this without this thing. incredible software. Thank you, Babel X. That's usually how that Buy goes. Buy stocks now. Uh, and it's very frustrating. It's very, very frustrating because it doesn't, it's no substitute for good old fashioned police work. And the level of trolling that exists on those platforms is fairly extreme. Yeah. Uh, also back in the news this week, again, oh gosh, it's like every week we hear something new about this company. Yeah, this is one another one of the hot ones. Face scanner Clearview AI aims to branch out beyond police. Uh, they're already in airports, maybe? Possibly? Hmm. Well, they, uh, they mentioned all kinds of things they wanted to branch out to. Banks, private businesses. There were some concerns that this would completely erode privacy in public in the U.S. And again, I was kind of like, we're already sort of there, aren't we? <laughs> we're, we're already careening down that slippery slope. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff in here from the AP. They've been able to identify dead bodies, even with facial damage. And it's like, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> Remember what happened in Michigan where the wrong people kept being arrested because the skin color was, you not, know, not what it was trained on. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's probably giving you a match. I would whether it's as- the absolute correct one. Uh, yeah. I also had the thought and I don't know that this, this is kind of outside of the scope of the article, but like, are we training up a, a whole generation of AI that expects your face not to change at all? Yes. Like, well, and then you think about, like, the pervasiveness of things like fillers and plastic surgery, and, like, we're just trying so hard not to age because we're trying to fit into the robot aesthetic. And is is the facial recognition aspect of this any better? It's like, if you need the capability to immediately identify someone, why are we using the face? Why wouldn't we use DNA? Why wouldn't we use something else? If you got a dead body, I really hope they're using genetic markers and storing genetic information and something that's a little bit more unique and reliable than this. Because even... Even the best AI is not going to get that right because there's not as many data points for it to key off of as with something like DNA. Or even something like a fingerprint? A uh, fingerprint still... <laughs> I guess that could be burned off, but... Yeah, it's if you, when you start to dig into the efficacy of fingerprints, you start to get really scared really fast because it's like, eh, it turns out that when you're talking about hundreds of millions of people, fingerprints are not great. Mm. There's only so many patterns. Yeah. It really just becomes down to a, a likelihood of, um, you know, how likely is it somebody nearby has a very similar fingerprint as as you do. Yeah. And so, they don't even have to be the same. They can just look very similar. And there's probably cases. But that's a story for another day. This is uh, it's snake oil. Like, if we need this level of identification, we need to use something other than faces. Period. But I think that a lot of people would object to that. A little bit more than, than they would have jumped. The other thought I had, too, when they talked about, like, being able to tell if some, even if someone was disfigured, was, like, what if a family member identified a corpse as, like, this was my family member, but the AI said it wasn't? 
does the does the authority release the body for funeral rites to the family, or are they like, no, the AI says it's not your family member? Yeah, there's going to be really fun Kafka esque stories we're covering in the next five to ten years. That the you know the body was kept in the morgue for twenty years because we didn't know whose family it was, even though they were like maybe they were wearing like jewelry or something that was like a family heirloom. And they're like, no, the AI says no, it's not you. It was found when the robotic you know body fetcher thing was replaced with the new bot model body fetcher thing and it's like the ai didn't even say that we had a body in there for 20 years it was just like oh there's no room to put bodies nobody really looked at no it no one close. looked into it yeah yeah if you give somebody the, the ability to not think about something they're absolutely not going to think about it that's weird to think about kind of like google google bans popular android apps that were secretly harvesting data you know why they were able to harvest data for so long because google didn't think about it do you know why Google didn't think about it? Because they had AI that would look at your application <laughs> and say, oh, this thing doesn't look like it's harvesting data. But then there were adversarial AIs, that's people, working against that AI to try to get their data harvesting apps on the App Store. And because it wasn't monitored, we have this. Also probably just brute force, too. Like, you have <laughs> thousands of people with nothing else going on in their lives trying to brute force it. Someone's going to get through. Google has booted dozens of Android apps from the Play Store after finding that the apps included a line of code that was discreetly harvesting data. Yep, just the one line of code. So it's they found a way through, and then that one line of code appeared in a lot of places. So the AI is not very good. To be fair, I guess that's an easy fix. Just remove the line, but still. But do you think removing the one line actually solves this problem? No. Who knows what other strange <laughs> things they've put in there, too? Yeah, I guarantee you, if you go to the, the, the Google Play Store That's right now... That's just the starting point. <laughs> Forensic Scientist Engagement Challenge. Go to the Play Store and download, like, five or six flashlight apps and tell me which one doesn't harvest your data. Oh. <laughs> There's a flashlight built in. You don't need to get an app for it. But, and yet... And yet people do. And yet they're still there. Why are they there? It doesn't make... Somebody's maintaining that application. Why is somebody maintaining that application? What did they get out of it? Dun, 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 Just dun, dun, the dun. satisfaction of a well-made product. <laughs> uh, why, 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 why does this happen? Liberal government tables legislation to force online giants to compensate news outlets. This is kind of a weird... I was thinking about how to, how to try to reframe this. So... <sighs> Okay, if you're if you're a search engine and you index something, if I go there and I search for I don't know, news on you know, new processor releases or whatever, and it gives me a result and it finds all the web pages that are that are doing that and I get a little summary from that. I think that is different than if I just go to the search engine page and it's preloaded like world news or it's preloaded other news. And there's stuff that I can just leave or that I can just look at on the website without leaving it. That does seem to be functionally different to me. Would you say that's the same or different? Uh, I I don't like this, but also I, I the only thing I can think of that's sort of similar is maybe like a library. But libraries do pay for the books that they offer. There's, there's also an angle to this that is um, kind of distracting. And I think that is... That if we if we want to look at like the destruction of media, which is what the CBC News article here talks about, it's like the destruction of media. We don't have uh, newspaper writers, we don't have Pulitzer Prize winning journalists, we don't have you know the way that we used to. I don't think that's big tech's fault. I think that's people like Rupert Murdoch's fault. I think they're a lot more involved. And so when I see an article like this that doesn't talk about big media or like Sinclair Broadcasting owning a lot of those things um i'm sort of skeptical because i'm sure that you know google is a contributing factor and search engine aggregation and stuff like that is a contributing factor and i think that it's it muddies the water when you have something that is purely a search engine a result for something versus something that's designed to capture your attention and keep you on the site like the, the goals that google has for uh showing you news and keeping you on a news feed is different than Google's goals of you search for something and it correctly finds the thing that you're searching for, but sends you somewhere else. One of those things sends you somewhere else. The other thing keeps you on Google so that they continue to get ad revenue from continued, you know, tweaks and things like that. Maybe in this scenario, 
you they sh- they do owe publishers something. But in the search engine scenario, I don't think they do. But I think both of those things pale in comparison in terms of the loss of value when you look at something like Rupert Murdoch or Sinclair Broadcasting or you know, multi-billionaires owning media. When you put it that way, it really does kind of feel like they're just fighting over the pennies of ad dollars. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. at the end of the day, that is that money adds up. It does. So, and it talks about, you know, news and radio programs. And it's like, again, all of those things have been co-opted and corrupted to the point that they're useless, which is what drove people online in the first place. I don't think that people would be getting as much news from the internet if television and radio weren't so worthless. You have to watch so many ads. I, I Sometimes I go home and visit my mom, and my mom usually watches the local news, and 90% of it is ads, and then you get, like, a few stories, and it's like, oh, back to our ad sponsors. And it's like, this is just useless. And as we know from the YouTube videos about the whole Sinclair broadcasting thing, those local things were very carefully curated because it was like, yeah. oh, these two newscasters are saying the same thing with the same intonation, and then 400, and then, it's controlled media. It's, yeah. It'll definitely... Watching that video, if even if you're not a paranoid person and you watch it that... It makes you a little paranoid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. I feel like our local news mostly covers local news, but when they do a, a yeah. big story like international, it is always the same. It is exactly the same, which is scary because you can't... You know, your local newscasters can't put their own little spin on it, which is probably not great. But yeah. also, you know, there, there were local people that they were smart and could, you know, do research and write opinions about things. That was a thing that existed. That's edi- editorializing, and they frown upon that in yeah. journalism. Yeah, they don't They don't really do that anymore. Well, I mean, editor- editorializing is fine if you've done the research and you say that that's what you're doing. But yeah, I guess, yeah, they don't want anything off of the message. <laughs> uh, <sighs> speaking of things that uh, you can be paranoid about... Block confirms cash app breach after former employee accessed U.S. customer data. This is another one of those situations where somebody got into something they weren't supposed to, and then the, the temptation was just too much. Cash app customers were impacted by the breach, but said it's contacting approximately 8.2 million current and former customers about the incident. Uh, uh. So, have you used this application? You might look into the breach and uh, taking steps to... Uh, see to what extent you were personally affected because you're probably not going to get the straight story from from them this is a thing clients use again uh again news of internal tools or of uh employees gone rogue (laughs) mailchimp says an internal tool was used to breach hundreds of accounts Ah! they uh used it to send like phishing emails and stuff i think it was mostly um companies that do like financial service kind of stuff yeah a social engineering attack led to access to the tool, and then they used the tool to uh, send mostly cryptocurrency emails, but also phishing and, and other sorts of fun things. And because MailChimp is well trusted, that made it through the spam filters. Yeah, I, I kind of hate email marketing. I hate working on it. <laughs> I hate getting it. Just everything about that cycle. But also, you know what our website really needs? An email newsletter sign up just as soon as you do anything. Oh yeah, and you can't you can't close it. You have to like do the dark pattern. There's no X. There's just like no. I don't want good deals it's on like, tech this stuff. This is a terrible idea. And it's like, but other websites do it, so it must be a good idea. It's a terrible idea. I hate pop ups. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, our next story. This one's a lot of fun, too. I figured you'd probably be really into this. Uh, Ubiquity files case against security blog, uh, blogger Brian Krebs over false accusations. I, I kind of read this article, and I was like, this kind of reads like YouTube drama to me. Like, sometimes, you know, you read it, and it's like, I don't really understand all the actors here. Obviously, we source stuff from Krebs, but I've always been under the impression he's fairly reliable. I think that Ubiquity is going to is going to lose this. This is a little bit Streisand effect. So Ubiquity, there was there, there was an event at Ubiquity. Ubiquity contends that the event was the result of a, an employee gone rogue and uh, holding their, ho- their data hostage and trying to create uncertainty for their customers. So Brian Krebs reported, hey, there's breach, customer data may be at risk. Out of an abundance of, of caution, they're going to probably reset your passwords, you know, blah, blah, blah. So Ubiquity contends that because an employee went rogue, that it wasn't really uh, a normal break-in. It wasn't like, you know, an Eastern European It wasn't, yeah, mass scale. And we told them about it. Yeah. But I think it's actually worse 
In a have, way, yeah. You have criminals that broke in, but internally your company is so discombobulated that something like that could happen. It's like uh, insider threat kind of thing. I mean... They also seemed upset that Krebs apparently only sourced like one or two people. And they're like, oh, you needed to have more sources. But it's like, well, I mean... <laughs> the source was the guy. Yeah, so... Mm, I don't know. Yeah, so I don't... I really Felt don't... Felt a little scummy. This is in uh, Virginia, which doesn't have super strong uh, protection. Like, California has uh, the slap lawsuit stuff where... If somebody is trying to use a lawsuit to cur- curtail someone's free speech, um, it's pretty well protected. This is in Virginia. Virginia has kind of a weak sauce version of slap. Uh, it's better than nothing, but it's almost nothing. And so it'll be interesting to see how this prevails. But I would be on... I think I think Krebs's disclosure was as responsible as it possibly could have been given the circumstances. And I think it was certainly to accepted industry standards... I think that ubiquity here is just uh, the ubiquity folks here are just butthurt. But in general, I think ubiquity has been going downhill in products and company for a long time. I even you know, I, I did some videos a, a, probably a year or two ago and saying mm, something's rotten in Denmark, and I got a lot of criticism for it. But I was right. Something was rotten in Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Look at that. Oh, and speaking of things that are we rotten, we got a big in Den- euro block Ooh. now. Uh, ECJ rules in favor of Irish murderer Graham Dwyer in phone data dispute. So this man killed his partner. Uh, sure looks that way. It was pretty brutal. And there was no evidence, though, except for digital evidence, like his phone records and stuff. And apparently they did not acquire that in a way that was above board. The, well, the phone provider under EU rules is not supposed to retain that data indefinitely and on every subscriber. And so if that was in violation of EU rules, then they might be able to get that evidence tossed out. And that was literally the only evidence. Yeah. So he might go free. Which is horrific to think about. Yeah. That that man might still be out on the street somewhere. Yeah, the article seemed, you know, if that's the only evidence against you, but the the article said that it was absolutely a slam dunk case, or the article made it sound like it was absolutely a slam dunk case against him, you would think that they would have more evidence than just that? Yeah, I don't... I feel like this might be maybe more local news. So, like, maybe if you're Irish and you're familiar with this case, you can tell us more about it. I read it and was like, I can't really tell. It sounds like he was messed up, but I don't know the full context. Yeah, yeah. Were there pictures on his phone, too? That, that, like, did the location data well, I lead to something else? The article sort of implied that he had put out, like, ads for women to sleep with and then stab. Yeah, yeah. And so that was public record, and it's like, well, we found this woman who was, you know stabbed in your apartment does this ad have anything to do with it and it's like well you can't prove that <laughs> they kind of did but nah. eh, i'm not eh. sure and yeah if you know more nuance about it let us know yeah i don't know it doesn't it doesn't seem great either way because on the one hand you know but on the other hand if there's there i don't well there's just <laughs> i don't know it just seems like a mess yeah speaking of a mess uh, police, re- speaking of stalking, police records show women are being stalked with Apple AirTags across the country. <laughs> Motherboard obtained reports of stalking, harassment, and abuse using AirTags. Uh, we reported uh, last week yeah. the guy used an, uh, an iWatch, put the iWatch in the wheel well of the car or around one of the spokes in the in the wheel or something. But the AirTags are only like 30 bucks. Yeah. So they're really easy to obtain. They, I think they said they had 150 cases that they had collected over a short period and almost, I think all of them except for one were women. Yeah, Apple has even said that they are changing some some stuff about how they do air tags so that you can say, "Hey, this air tag that is, is not in your in, vicinity, yeah, yeah. Is, that is not enrolled, has been following you around for a while." But only if you're an iOS user. Yeah. If you're on Android or you don't have your phone with you, you won't get that notification, which <laughs> seems like a major oversight. That's because in Apple's eyes, as they have repeatedly shown, if you're not in the Apple ecosystem... You're you, inhuman. Yeah, you, you are a You do not deserve to be citizen. protected. <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah, are trying to work on, they are trying to work on Air, AirTag stuff for Android, but again, second class experience, like iMessage. It's like, uh, oh, you're in our iMessage group and you're on Android? <laughs> Shun the greenie. The greenie. Yeah, I saw I saw when these came out, I was like, someone's going to use these to get stalked. And here Immediately we are. Immediately everybody yeah. is using these for stalking. Uh, people have also used these for stolen equipment recovery. Uh, there was the story about the bicycle chop shop where somebody, you know, traced their, their bike back. There was the YouTuber that moved out to the country. 
like he just picked somewhere that was small. It's like this 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 area is great because it's cheap and the people seem nice and friendly. Yeah. And then he was immediately robbed by like three different people and and uh, he put air tags in everything and then he put air tags that were meant to be discovered on top of air tags and then he just followed them around and went to the state police and said, "Look, I got all the stuff." And so the state police were like, "Oh yeah, you're right. Here's all your stuff." So usually this is terrible, but in my little small town. What you do if you ever got robbed was you immediately went to the pawn shop in town because everything was immediately hacked and you could get your stuff back that way. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, this is all uh, my stuff. It's terrible. What are you doing? You had to prove that it was yours, but usually, like, if it was something like a gun, you know, you'd, ha- you'd have it engraved or something. Uh, or you could put the serial number on the blockchain or pictures of you with your stuff on the blockchain. I don't think you want to explain to the guy <laughs> running the counter at the local pawn shop in Eastern Kentucky what the blockchain is. Uh, they might know. Maybe. UK's big crypto push includes minting its own NFT. Oh, there's a quote in here that's Ooh. amazing. That's just so, uh, so disturbing. Uh, the announcement was part of an ambitious plan to make the UK a global hub for crypto asset technology and to ensure firms can invest, innovate, and scale up uh, in this country. My, every time I read about NFTs, my eyes just glaze over. I'm like, I don't care about this at all. Uh, high risk and be prepared to lose all their money if they choose to invest in them. <laughs> it's not really a long article in protocol. No. I, don't, I don't think this is going to work out for the UK government the way that they have in mind that it, that it will. Who wants that? <laughs> now, who wants these? Nobody. You I know, guess some people do. but You know what some people want? Border Patrol's use of Amazon Wicker messaging app draws scrutiny. So Wicker is end-to-end encryption. That means that there's sort of a problem logging this and keeping track of it and border patrol is using it can you see how that might be a problem i i am well, the only thing i took away from that article is it is amazing to me with the budgets that we give all of our government agencies that they haven't built their own messaging app that they can audit oh no they have that's the whole point but, of using the, the encrypted app but that says amazon yeah why would they they're using that because you can't audit that one Oh. <laughs> and but here's my other question though is like why is that being allowed? It's not normally allowed. That's sort of frowned upon. Mm. It's like you're using the you're not using the official app where we log things. And so you know that's a sword that cuts both ways. I've, as we've seen in the global theater, uh, you know, if you don't tow the party line and you can have all of your messages looked at at any given time, if you don't absolutely 100% believe whatever it is that they're telling you and that you're not, you know, willing to die for that, you're kicked out. But at the same time, uh, we need to be able to see if anybody is uh, behaving outside the law or beha- outside the rules. And so if somebody's messaging somebody else about, you know, this crazy stuff that they're doing, it would be nice to be able to look in and say, hey, this person is operating, you know, uh, uh, sort of outside specifications. Yeah. This person's breaking the law on the border, which you can imagine what that entails. Yeah. But, yeah, but that's well, but, for but government. You can, see, like, you can also see this person doesn't believe the narrative. We have to eject them. But, right. like, if you work for the government, you probably have to have a security clearance stuff. Like, you kind of know going in, right? Yeah. Like, that's the way it's going to be. Yeah. You're no longer a private citizen when you're working as an agent for the government. <laughs> They're going to look at everything. Yeah. <laughs> which, again, if you have a security clearance, you should know. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which. Germany shuts down service for Russian darknet marketplace Hydra. Lots of stories about this this week. Germany, uh, German authorities have seized 25.2 million USD in Bitcoin. So there's a lot happening with security. And we actually have several stories about like the German computer emergency response teams they are on the ball. I'm very impressed with everything that they've been doing, both in the private sector and in uh, in, in the government sectors. And we've got several stories, and this is just the, the first one. They're probably not all going to sh- all show up at once. But, uh, yeah, Germany has shut down the service for, for this and done a lot more. But uh, this is basically a darknet kind of thing, so, like, you could buy illegal things on it. And it gets worse from here. So, <laughs> exciting times. I think I did kind of a Euro block, so the other story about this sort of thing is later in the... Yeah, yeah. Uh, switching, well, this is not Europe, but... Switching gears a little bit. Chinese hackers abuse VLC media player to launch malware loader. So this is one of, of two stories this week. I think we left out the other one. Um, but uh, this is uh, relying on other people's binaries to launch your malware. So there wasn't anything wrong with VLC media player. 
Uh, this malware was able to exploit a weakness in VLC Media Player, which a lot of people have installed, to uh, do more extra bad things. So, uh, it's like, what was it here? It's like the, the, the it was tracked in mid-2021 and was active in February 2022. So, it's using VLC to deploy custom malware loader. This happened again with the Adobe Creative Suite and Node.js. And so, a security researcher published a thing and said, Hey, did you know that Adobe bundles Node.js? You can just inject whatever you want into the Adobe Creative Suite and it will run with whatever permissions the Adobe Suite runs as, which is typically elevated permissions. Yeah. Uh. Cool. Another reason the Adobe Suite sucks. <laughs> I mean, that's not their fault. But yeah. Kind of their fault. So it's like at least two members of the App10 threat group have been charged in the U.S. for computer hacking to help the uh, the MSS and uh, you know those places uh, steal intellectual property and confidential business information from managed service providers. And so this is this kind of thing is is part of the the reason that the the U.S. government is kind of on edge that. Uh, you know, Chinese companies like Huawei that pop up and have a really good deal on products. It's like, how did they do that? Is it, did they figure out a cheaper way to exploit it? Or are they just trying to do this so that American companies go out of business? There's a, there's a, you know, whether exaggerated or not, there's a component of truth there. Just maybe a tiny nugget I mean, of truth, but Walmart and Amazon did it. China's probably just taking notes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've also got a follow-up to our uh, Viasat satellite storage, which is the last time that Chris and I did the news. Oh, yeah. Modem wiping malware caused Viasat satellite broadband outage in Europe. Yeah, so this was on April 1st. And what's well, not an April Fool's Day story, but it's, it's April 1st. And Feels so like it. It took a while. That was, what, like five weeks, six weeks from the time this happened? And so a uh, post-mortem has been done on this. And, yeah, it points back to Russia. Mm. The malware, the actual name of the malware was that. U-K-R-O-P. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Ukrainian operation. Oh. <laughs> I was like, Krup? I was like, is that a Russian word? And then, yeah. yeah uh, that maybe. makes more sense, huh? Yeah. Mm. They didn't even try to, to disguise that, did they? Yeah, yeah. Wow. The, they said that the malicious commands disrupted modems in Ukraine and other European countries. Huh. There was. I don't think we put a story in here about it. I think it's resolved now, but... Did you see Puerto Rico lost all their power? 100% of customers had lost their power earlier this week. No. Did they get it back? I think it's back now, but there was a fire at uh, like one substation and it just took down the whole island. Yeah, that's uh, it's not great. Yeah. They're just, just now starting to get things put back together after the last natural disaster. Yeah. Uh, this was also, oh, this is, is this the guy that got hurt? There was a guy that got hurt. I don't think he was hurt. I think he's managing like aid in that area and they're trying to figure out the routes to get to the people who are hurting, uh, and they're trying to avoid. Axios has this. Yeah. Uh, Jose Andres, Apple Maps was sending me into Russian-controlled territory. So he's on the ground. Yeah. Trying to offer aid, not in Russia, just near Russia. But not, not military aid. I think it's humanitarian aid. Not in Russia. And Apple Maps is like, oh, you got to go around. It's like, no, well, let's not go around. He, he says in the article, he's like, it should be like Star Trek. It should just know. But I don't think that's totally fair <laughs> to Google Maps either because even people who are monitoring the war every day for every hour, like they're struggling to know where the lines are as things change and who controls what zone. Assume the line is always, you know, like if you're where you are, it's like, let's try to route you going this way, not that way. That way, yeah. And it, <laughs> But you can't know that, right? I mean, it's even like traffic accidents in Google Maps now here in the US. Like the only time it knows about it is when people report it in the app, but you might not have service yeah. in a war zone. You can't just expect it to know. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I like about having a global audience is when we say something stupid, the yeah, people, someone will probably call me the people will, will come out and say, no, this is what's really happening in my country. That's just, you know, Western nonsense. It's like, you know, uh, uh, Chevron actually killed all of the rainforest animals in my entire country. And there's this thing happening because blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I had no idea because that wasn't That wasn't thing. reported yeah. here, yeah. And then you dig into it and it's really crazy. Well, that's also happening right now at a global scale. The people cold calling Russia... Call, wait, bleh. The people cold calling to chip away at Russia's digital iron curtain. So a lot of people bleh. only get their news from TV and radio huh. in that part of the world, apparently. And they have some strong opinions and maybe are not getting the full story. Maybe we're not getting the full story either, but it's, it seems like it's, uh, I think here in the U S people are 
Even if they aren't getting the full story, I think more people are willing to hear that, though. They're like, oh, yeah. I might not know the full details. Yeah, but it's it's not like... It doesn't even... Even saying that, I think, lends a kind of credibility that's not deserved in this case. It's it's like, oh, it might be like 50-50 or 60-40. It's like, no, I think it's like 98-2. Yeah, that's fair. Which uh, is a little different, perhaps, than the aforementioned Chevron, we killed the entire rainforest, but we got your oil cool beans story cool beans <laughs> so <laughs> yeah the, but people are calling from all over i think the story they talk about here one of the women they talk about her name she's from lithuania and she's calling people just cold calling them and being like you don't know the full story here's what's happening there's <laughs> refugees in my country blah 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 i mean there, there are stories about you know calling you know uh, uh cousin oliver in the you, you know in the old country and they're they're like, hey, this is happening. And they're like, I don't think so. Yeah, I hope exactly. you're okay, though. And it's like, what? my town has been bombed. What's weird to me about those sort of situations is when, if a family member called me, say, from Germany, I have some family still over there, and was like, hey, terrible things are happening. Why would you not offer them a place to stay? Yeah, exactly. That's what I think is weird. Like, if one of my great aunts was like, hey, terrible things are happening, I'd be like, do you want to come here? Like, we can g- figure out how to get you a flight. <laughs> And instead, they're just like, that sucks for you. I mean, we basically did that for a couple of people in our audience that were living in the Ukraine. It's like, well, I mean, you guess you can come here. I, well, I don't know. Get, yeah. Which would out. have been a good move because the State Department would give you asylum. So, uh, uh. you were already here. Uh, I don't know. Speaking of things that are questionably a good move or not, this might be... This is kind of the big one this week too, right? Yeah, this might be the, uh, the YouTube shorts. Oh, yeah. YouTube shorts. We gotta go quick. Oh, I can't read it. It's too small. FBI operation aims to take down massive Russian GRU botnet. So here's the story. There's a botnet and there's perhaps a a pending cyber attack. This botnet was composed of compromised Asus routers and other stuff, but a lot of home grade stuff. But this stuff is pretty powerful home grade equipment. As we've seen, that's enough to take out hospitals and to use as a springboard for other more sophisticated attacks. So here's what the FBI did, the US FBI. They were able to get into the botnet, but not in such a way that they would go undetected. They were not gonna be in there forever. So they used their access to preemptively go into all of the equipment that was participating in the botnet and remove it from the botnet. So they installed their own software on equipment they didn't own and without permission. They didn't tell anybody this was happening. And that definitely did disrupt the botnet, but there's definitely an ethics consideration. There's an ethics question there. And it is, you know, do should that be standard operating procedure? It Was this an extraordinary situation where perhaps there was a pending cyber attack or, or whatever? They knew about it for a long time, but they didn't reveal their hand uh, until... They say right before it was going to be used for an attack. We have no way of verifying that, mm-hmm. but uh, they definitely seem to be aware of it enough to very quickly take control of the botnet and very quickly shut the botnet down before the botnet operators could respond. Because there's a chance that the botnet operators could have said, hey, wait a minute, somebody else has access to this. We need to take steps to regain control of our botnet network and deploy software and, and deal with it that way. So this is a, it's a really... It's not a clean cut situation, but I think I would err on the side of doing this kind of thing. Um, I've been on the receiving end of, of you know, botnet activity, and uh, it's definitely the case that sometimes there's a vigilante that shows up that's not really part of a law enforcement agency and shows up and they do a bunch of stuff, and then the botnet goes away. I think in this case, given the situation and given the potential for damage, I'm okay with this, but it's definitely something you got to decide on a case by case basis. I agree. I don't know if that was 60 seconds, but hopefully they can cut it down to 60 seconds. Woo! What what timestamp was that? So we can tell the editors, chat. That was 38.35. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. It's a tough decision. It's a tough... You can't make that... You can't say always in this situation, 
do this. I think you have to you have to just look well, at it and think about it. And it's hard too to th- say like if it had gone through and something terrible had happened, would everyone been like, why didn't the FBI do anything? <laughs> or if you're in Canada, it's like the FBI was in my modem doing what? It's like you're you're, you're right to be paranoid about that it, from now until the end of time. And it really makes the jokes you make about like, oh, the NSA is in my Discord server. <laughs> Maybe they are. <laughs> They're just monitoring to make sure that nobody's planning to denial. Use server. your toaster to <laughs> mess up infrastructure <laughs> uh, well moving right along uh, uh, <laughs> more news russia of, block <laughs> yeah more news of this this week intel suspends all operations in russia effective immediately yeah a lot of a lot of the u.s com- u.s government has said u.s companies doing business in there you're gonna have to stop so basically everybody that hadn't already stopped they're stopping yeah they were like we're very concerned they have 1200 employees in russia and they're like, we're very concerned for them yeah but i don't know what they're gonna do for yeah. those employees? I'm they not didn't sure, say. I'm not sure we'll be able to get reliable information out of there because... Oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, next story. Hacker takes over Drake, Eminem, Justin Bieber's YouTube. And it wasn't just them. Yeah, it wasn't just them. It was kind of a lot. Yeah, it was like Taylor Swift. Uh, let's see. L- Lil Nas X. Harry Styles. These are some big pop news kind of people if you're into that sort of thing. <laughs> Michael, the Weekend. Michael Jackson's Ghosts YouTube channel. Well, they usually they run by their, <laughs> their PR teams. Uh, Vivo, I think, is where they post a lot of that stuff. Yeah, the hacker uploaded a video titled Justin Bieber Free uh, Paco Sands featuring Will Smith and all but to Bieber's YouTube channel. But it was just weird and bizarre. Yeah, it was, I think, a video of the guy just playing guitar and doing like a cover of a song. Yeah, so... And uh, everyone was very concerned by it. And YouTube was extra concerned by it because they're like, I don't know how he got in here. (laughs) They got into all of them. Yeah. Is it? Will we find that one label was compromised? Will we find that yeah. one, one label had the botnet malware? It was probably it, it was probably Vivo related because Vivo does all the music videos. Hmm. Not good. Well, that brings us to the end of the government and security block. Hopefully, you had an adventure. It was a little intermixed. Usually, we try to have more of a clean break, but I I kind of organized in a weird way. So. That's fine. What do we got for tomorrow? Uh, it's gonna be long. It's like oops, all business, and then. We, there's, a, there's a lot of business news. I think on Friday we'll have a, another very long episode as well. It's going to have like 30 stories in it. <laughs> there's a lot of pent-up business news. Yeah. We will see you guys then. Bye.